Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Fighters, Coaches, and Fathers. And in this episode, I'm absolutely uh, delighted and I'm a bit starstruck and in awe to have uh, Din Aero, Din Thomas, um, uh, on the show today. Din, how are you, my friend? I'm good, man. How are you? Uh, listen, I just want to say, I, I, I talked to you earlier too, but uh, doing some research for the, the show, you've really done this an amazing transition from from fighter to coach to actor. And uh, I just want to say this to everybody that's watching this right now. Um, so you just did a short film, which is amazing to watch, called Sandbox Memories. And, uh, and, and the greatest thing about that film is if anybody goes to you, and says, hey, uh, what was it like watching Sandbox? I watched Sandbox Memories. I know for a fact that you'll be able to go, oh, yeah, what'd you think of the ending? And you'll know totally. <laughs> you'll, know, yep. you'll know totally if that guy watched that. Because I was yep. like, because I fast forward some in the middle because I knew we had to meet. But I was like screaming at the TV. I was like, that's garbage. <laughs> like, so I'm not, we're not going to give it away. We're going to link it up uh, to the channel. So, but you guys got to gotta watch this great, great beginning performance and end it there a, ter a terrible ending but a great beginning to this <laughs> film uh, and guys will understand that but uh yeah everybody says the ending man it gets them because they just they can't believe it there is um so let's let's go back a little bit here and uh i mean as i did some research on sort of where you've been and how this all started and getting into mma let's talk a little bit about you know growing up in delaware and then to your 12 and then the move to to florida and sort of your journey uh you know what were your parents doing and then and the journey in the martial arts is that a good place to start yeah that's that's a great place to start but i don't you know it's funny you know i never get to talk about this stuff so like you know if i'm kind of all over the place it's just because i'm like bringing back old memories because i never really get to talk about this but um growing up in delaware was cool not a lot of people really know a lot about delaware because it's like a small state but it's right in the middle of of everything. I mean, it's 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 thirty minutes from Philly. It's an hour from Baltimore. It's hour and a half from New York. It's you know, it's it's right by it's right by Jersey. I mean, it's just it's really in the middle of everything. So you got a lot of influence from a lot of big cities. Um, so growing up there was really cool, man. I had a lot of good friends, and um, and and I was just you know, I, but I grew up as a quiet kid. You know, I grew up as a quiet kid. I played sports. You know, I played football and I played baseball and I had a great, great, great childhood. But then I was ripped. I was stripped of that when I moved to Florida, basically because my father was an alcoholic and my mother needed to get away from him at the time. You know, he was, you know, destructive to the family. So she moved myself, my my next older brother and my younger sister. We moved to Florida when i was uh just turning 13 years old so you know i felt like at some level like my childhood of what i can remember it being so fun like in the summer times just having so much fun just being stripped of me and then moving to this desolate area of florida called port st Lucie, and uh and i had because it was such a desolate area i had a lot of time to like sit and think you know, sit and think and learn about myself. So that was kind of the the, hum, the very humble beginnings of 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 Dean Thomas. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting transition. I mean, and and a lot of fighters we talk to and, and their journey into trying to positively get there, but they have this something that was taken away. Uh, my father yeah. passed away when I was a year and a half. Uh, my mother remarried. They divorced in in like three years later, and so it's always been sort of that thing where there's always this chip on your shoulder that comes out as a teenager or however that happens. But um, so you moved to Port St. Lucia and you're about 12 years old. Yeah. And now you're in this place where you've got to grow up quick, I guess. Yeah. 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 I had to grow up quick. I mean, like I said, you know, I didn't have, you know, growing up, like my father was a great guy. He just had an alcohol problem. I mean, but he taught us a lot. He taught me and my, my and my siblings a lot of very valuable lessons. You know, he taught us about being independent, and I think that's probably the most important lesson he, that he taught me is to be self reliant and, and independent. I remember being like ten years old, just staying out to like midnight because he just had that type of trust. I never did anything bad, but he had that type of trust. But he taught us that independence. So when I got to Florida, you know, I was twelve, thirteen years old. You know, I was like, I was, you know. 
you know, my mother, was she was, you know, doing her thing. But, you know, me and my brother, we were kind of the, the men of the house. You know, we just we did whatever we wanted, which was no, pretty much nothing. But we had the freedom to do whatever we wanted. You know, so we would just, um, you know, just kind of hang out and just do nothing. Because it was like at the time, Port St. Lucie was like a real small, desolate area and just like really boring and and just a really crappy area to live in, to kind of grow up in. So, so you're, you're at Port St. Lucie, you, you, you're doing some athletics there, um, in high school then? No. So I, so by that time, uh, so by that time I didn't really get into, like, I was an athlete as a kid, you know, I played football and baseball as a, you know, up until I was 12. And then at that point I just stopped when I moved to Florida, I just stopped for whatever reason. I don't know why I just stopped. and. I taught myself how to cut hair. So really? yeah, I remember being, I was in eighth grade and we didn't have a barber. My mother didn't have a lot of money anyway. So we didn't have a barber. So I said, listen, save money on haircuts. Just get me some clippers. I'll figure this out. And I taught myself how to cut hair. So wow. how old all, doing that? I was 13 years old. Oh, wow. That's so amazing. I, so I taught myself how to cut hair using my brother's head as a, as you know, the, the Guinea pig. Does and he still have all his ears? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, he's he gets scars all over his head now. No, but I, I had a legit business. I had a legit illegal business running out of my mother's garage for all through high school, cutting everybody's hair. I mean, I was a beast. I used to cut everybody's hair in high school. Is, does does uh, Tyrone Woodley let you cut his hair now? No, he doesn't. Like, I don't <laughs> honestly like at this point, I don't even trust myself. Like, uh, you know, Ty Tyron has to be super clean. It has to be super perfect. So, like, I don't trust myself to mess his hair up. Okay. All right. I get it. Uh, and I get, completely understand. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that independence part. And uh, that's cool. So, you start your hair business. And uh, when I look at Wikipedia, there's this moment that happens uh, around age 17 where some stuff goes down, man. And uh, I mean, and then it seems like you were about to go on a good path or a bad path. Would that be accurate? Yeah. I mean, you know, when you're 17 years old, that's kind of where I feel like in every young man's life, it's kind of like you're going to go one of two ways. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but that just seems like one of them moments where it's like, this is, this is what's going to happen to you. This is going to dictate the next five years of your life. And that's what happened to me. You know, I was, here's the weird thing is that, you know, I didn't, I quit high school football every year. Like I said, I was an athlete when I was coming up, but every year I'd try out for the football team and I would quit, which is, I know it's embarrassing to say. So I would quit every what, year. Why? I don't what? know. I just, I just didn't, I, I didn't like vibe with other members on the team. I just, uh, you know, I just didn't feel like I could live up to their expectations. I thought, you know, that's that's really what it was. I didn't. I Welcome couldn't to the real world, right? Welcome yeah, right, to the yeah. real world. That's just how it is, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I would try out. I'd do the spring football season. Come around, I'd quit. So, um, but when I was seventeen, I said, you know what? I'm going to try out. I'm going to walk on to a college and try out to play football. That was my goal. And that summer after I graduated, things didn't work out like that. I was messing with a girl. I had been messing with this girl for two years, 11th and 12th grade. She broke up with me and I didn't like that. 17 years old, puppy love. Mm. So I didn't like that. So, you know, I'm trying going back and forth, but at this time, but I had a plan to go walk all the way to college. I had, I had, you know, uh, applied for Grambling State University, Texas. So I had applied for three and I got accepted in all of them and I was going to walk on to college there. Oh, yeah. Wow. But, one night, I went over her house, snuck over, stole my mother's car, went over her house, and he was there. Her new boyfriend was there. Yeah, he, he showed up, and I knocked on her window. You know, I was creeping. I was a little creep. I was creeping up to the window. I knocked on her window, and she didn't come to the window. Instead, her new boyfriend came to the window. Oh, and either and you, he, were, you were like, oh, my goodness, what happened to my girlfriend? And then you realize, oh, that ain't no girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm realizing. I'm like, what happened to my girlfriend? I'm like, and that's when I realized that she broke up with me. So then, and he did the worst thing you could have ever did to me. He shut the blinds on me. 
<laughs> I locked oh, on the window. Man. He saw me out there. He said, "Whap!" and shut the blinds on me. And I'm knocking. I'm knocking. I'm like, "All right, you know what?" So I ran back to the car and I waited for him to leave. And he tried to leave. He got in his little truck. I ran up on him, opened his door. Pow! My MMA career started. <laughs> and I was so mad. I was so mad. Then he gets out and we're fighting and it's fighting in the middle of the street right in front of her house. And we're fighting in the middle of the street. Her father comes out, breaks it up and everything. And it's, I mean, it's embarrassing. He's bleeding everywhere. A day later, they, um, the cops came and arrested me for, uh, aggravated battery dude man it's like in, in everything when you're in a teenager like you just think back just to, to 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 sort of frame the situation everything is a wedding or a funeral like yeah. and so yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. control your emotions as a kid no, you get to learn you're 17, years old, you're 17 years old you're just like you think that that's that's it so um but you know what but it was the best thing to happen to me mm -hmm. because so I went to jail. Well, so they arrested me. I was seven because I was 17. I went to, you know, the juvenile detention center and I, I stayed in there for, for three weeks. And as soon as I got out, they rearrested me as an adult because I turned 18 in jail. Whoa. Yeah. So in juvenile detention center. So they rearrested me, put me back in jail. And then I got out and then I got sent, sentenced to 52 weekends in jail. So that, which means that on Friday I had to go to jail, get booked. On Sunday, they let me out. Next Friday, same thing. Next Friday, same. I had to do that for 52 weekends. What the? Dude, I've never heard of any sentence like that. It sounds like it's yeah. probably a good sentence or the worst possible sentence it's, ever because you couldn't do anything. But you couldn't do nothing. You couldn't do nothing. But it was, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I was out during the week. And at this time, prior to this, my sister had showed me the ultimate fighting championship. And I was like, so for them 52 weeks, I couldn't leave the County. I had to stay in the County. I couldn't leave the County. So for those 52 weeks, I stayed home all week watching UFC fights, studying fights by, and I bought like the Henzo Gracie instructional videos. And I bought the, you know, the, the Marco Huas instructional videos, the Mario Sperry instructional videos. So all week, I would watch videos. I'd cut hair, watch videos, study MMA stuff. Well, at the time it was called Valley Tudo stuff. Yeah. Then on the weekends, I'd go to jail. So <laughs> I taught my fight. I taught myself not only how to cut hair, but I taught myself how to fight using instructional videos while while so, I was doing weekends in jail. So, Dan, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, because I don't want to get you in any more trouble. But 52 weekends in jail, everybody in jail probably hates you. And because uh, you're the weekend guy. Yeah, I come and in now, on weekends. <laughs> yeah. And now, and now I used to work in corrections at the young offender. So just so I, I, I get this stuff going on. And uh, so then you um, you start doing these tapes and all of a sudden you got to go into jail and every weekend and now you got this tapes and now you got and to me it's kind of like you're sitting there and everyone starts and there's just one moment maybe there's never happened and maybe it's all hearsay but did anything happen on one of those weekends where you got to use some of the Valentino <laughs> stuff were you like no <laughs> oh, man i ain't never doing any of this stuff no but i was prepared and that was why i did it i was prepared you know when i started doing when i started fighting the sole purpose of me fighting was so that i'd never get my ass kicked in the street you know mm -hmm. and that was the sole purpose and to even to this day like i still had that same mentality and philosophy i just don't want to get beat up in the street you know well, i don't need to, i don't need to be yeah right? yeah i don't need to be a professional fighter no more but i still never want to get beat up in the street so i'm you know i still work on make sure i got my little hook and my jab is still work. you know what i'm saying but but i don't but that's still it to this day like i don't want to get beat up in the street yeah i hear you and whenever we go back to episodes of uh dana white's so looking for a fight and it's you and matt sarah and there's some good guy talking to you guys like he wants to get the fight or something <laughs> and it's just Awesome, but they really they don't really mess with you. They always going after Matt Sarah. AJ Scales and I were at a UFC in 2003, I think, and uh, we met Matt Sarah before anybody else. He's such a good guy, but um, I, we're a little bit off topic. But I got to ask this question. Dana White calls you one of his favorite guys. You and Matt Sarah in that show. And doing <laughs> that. But then after Tyrone does this unbelievable dark, like wins the title, beats Darren Till. 
was was Dana okay? Did he had eat? Did he had eat something that made him his stomach upset or something? Because if you take looks at pictures on the back of that, he he didn't seem like he was himself after that fight. And I don't want to get you in any trouble, but is there a situation there or? Nah, you know, like a lot of people, you know, jump to the conclusion that Dana just doesn't like Tyron, and like it's easy to go that route because it's drama and everybody wants to hear drama, but. You know, here's the thing about Dana. Like, one, he he's suffering from a condition called Meniere's disease, where he easily like he loses his his equilibrium and he just doesn't feel well all the time. So that could have been the reason why he had to leave. I do know for a fact that he had a, a flight to catch right afterwards, and that's the way it is. Like when we film them shows, people don't understand. Like when we film them shows, as soon as we're done rapping. Dana's car is already packed and he's to the airport, so like he doesn't wait around. He doesn't he doesn't have time for that. So. And, and, you know, like, and Dana goes hard in life, man. Like he, yeah. like sometimes like he's up late he wakes up early. Like sometimes he might not just be feeling good. So I don't ever, I don't want to assume that Dana was just, you know, doesn't like Tyron. So he didn't want to stick around for his moment. I mean, maybe he, he might've really legitimately been sick and that's mm -hmm. what I'm going with. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. It was just, he's interesting, but man, um, what class, uh, Tyron has always carried himself with. And yourself always with such a high level of class and uh, just amazing to see him get the black belt. And uh, that's cool. Um, I, we're going to get off topic again. So let's go yeah, back. Yeah. yeah, all right. Uh, okay. But now, uh, so now you have this situation where you're 52 weeks in uh, in, in jails and, and you're getting through it. Uh, you're doing your Valley Tudo trainings from the video cassettes. What, what, what's, what's the next sort of things that happen? So, you know, as I was doing that, and then I found like this local karate school that uh, said they taught shoot fighting, which was a bit inaccurate. I mean, the guy knew more than anybody else. But now now looking back, I'm like, man, he really didn't know that much. You know, he didn't really know anything, actually. But he had gave us a, he gave us opportunity and he, he gave me the opportunity to meet people like in Miami. So um, so at that time in Hialeah, they started doing these amateur shoot fighting events down there. And that got me my first exposure with competition. So we start. I started competing as an amateur shoot fighter back. This was 1995, 96 year, 96. So I started competing in that, and uh, and I did that for the next. I did that for two years, competing in amateur shoot fighting, and then at that point, you know, it was not much we could have really did there. Me and um. A buddy of mine, Paul Rodriguez, who actually he fought in the UFC and he uh, owns an American top team gym in, in Orlando. But me and him were like we were the ones that were like studying and watching videos and practicing every day because we're from the same hometown. But anyway, mm -hmm. so it, after we did shoot fighting for about two years, we moved to Orlando and uh, and that's where the scene was a little bit bigger. They had more Brazilian guys there who did like real jujitsu. And then. Um, and then that's where like MMA in Florida really started in in Orlando. Like the first shows were in Orlando, and uh, and that's where I got my first experience with professional mixed martial arts was in Orlando. Like before two thousand, like oh yeah, this was nineteen. This was this was nineteen ninety eight. Yeah, yeah, right before actually the. Well, that's cool to say because one of the other really things about you is that you were. I think you were either on the first card or it was the first sanctioned fight for the ufc ever in vegas was yours. yeah it was yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. so that just ties in really nicely to to the fact that you've been looking for this trying to get there and 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 move forward so you go from amateur and uh we always talk about this uh now with all the other guys in the shows that there was not really any amateur anywhere else so you had to go pro way before you were ready right yeah, yeah well like i said the amateur was only was amateur shoot fight and then that was the only reason why it was amateur because it was that's what it was. It was just shoot fighting and there was no pro shoot fighting. There was no pro nothing. So it was either like that amateur shoot fight and stuff that they were doing in, in Hialeah in Miami. And they were only doing that because like, it was easy for them to do because my first one wasn't even in a ring. It was on a mat in a gym, and I, you know? So yeah. it wasn't even on a mat. It was, it was it wasn't even in a ring or a cage. It was just on a mat in a gym. So as I turned pro and the reason why I say pro my first pro fight, the reason why I say this is because I got paid. And I sh so the, my very first pro fight was actually in Tampa. And I show up to an event to fight a guy. And 
my opponent didn't show up. Another guy's opponent didn't show up. So then it was me and this other guy who had no opponents. Unfortunately for me, the guy who I, the guy who didn't have an opponent was 225 pounds. Ugh, a what football you, one, player. What are you, 150 was, at this point? Yeah, I was 150. I was 150. This guy was 225. He was a football player from Bethune Cookman. And he showed up to fight. His opponent didn't show up. So they asked me if I would fight him. I said, sure, why not? And I ended up fighting this guy. I beat him with a submission in four minutes. And the promoter gave me 30 bucks. <laughs> my my pro my pro career has commenced. <laughs> wow. For which would, yeah. would you get it? My guess is Armbar from Guard. No, I actually do I actually took You're him gonna... down. What? And I, yeah, it was I took him down and key locked him. In four Side. minutes, yeah. From, from Side Side. Control. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He took him down past his guard and key locked him. Yeah, any of those uh, big muscly guys always get scared when you get the key locks on because the rotators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, there. for sure. Like he felt it was like ah. But the weird thing is, so like when I, I'm I'm remember it's like standing in the corner just before I'm about to fight, and one of my corner guys runs up to me and goes, "Oh my god, I just heard he benches 450 pounds." I said, uh, "Man, if you don't shut up." <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! But here's the thing. So now the legend of Dinero Thomas starts, right? Yeah, you take on a challenge against a guy who's two fifty, who's far stronger than you, and probably a pretty good fighter, but doesn't have the skill level. You rise up to that challenge. Thank God, get into the position. Get the take. You get your thirty bucks, but you get something else in that win, don't you? I got a lot of confidence. What I got a lot of confidence. I got a lot of confidence. What happens next? What happens after that? So. But and all this kind of ties together because you know it all ties together from you know when I said I played sports and I quit every year and I didn't accept these challenges. Um, and those are the reasons why I accepted that challenge because, like, every time I was presented with a challenge, I would go, Damn, I can't. Like, I quit football in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th. I quit all them years. So when they asked me if I'd fight this guy, I said, I'm not quitting. I'm not, I didn't come here to, to not do this. And that's why I said, yeah. So after that fight, I fought in a tournament. It was a four man tournament in Orlando. Um, and I won that. It was a four man lightweight tournament. I won that. And this is the days in this. It wasn't sanctioned. Keep this in mind. This yeah, stuff there. wasn't sanctioned. Yeah. So I remember I fought, there was four guys in the event. I fought the first guy. I beat him in the first round. The guy who I was supposed to fight got hurt to move into the second round. So they brought a guy in from the audience to fight me in the finals. Jeez, man. Yeah. yeah. And we, we could even have shorts. Did you fight him in a, in a, they in let, a... Yeah. <laughs> somebody let him borrow shorts and gloves. <laughs> I ended up beating him. And then again, I made 500 bucks to win this tournament. I, it gave me five one hundred dollar bills. I thought I was rich. You're, you're like, man, how many haircuts would I have, dude, yeah. to do this? Now you get this. I thought I was rich, man. I thought I was rich. So I went on a tear. Like so, for like the next um, for like the next year, I was just I was on a tear. Whether it was you know in fights or just going to gyms in Orlando and just terrorizing people, like I was just busting people up and just and just creating a name for myself. You know, I really was. And then that's when I got the call to fight in Japan. In fact, I got in fact I got a call from um from from Japan to fight Mok Sakurai. And I was supposed to fight him first at like 167 pounds. I mind I weighed 150, but I was gonna do it. But then they went with a Brazilian guy. And um then they said, All right, cool, we're gonna use you later. And then six months later they called me to fight Kauno. Yeah, right after he beat Sato. Yeah, I met Carl yeah. in uh, in uh, 2003. I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, tough fighter. Oh, tell me about it. So, I, uh, so then they called me to fight him, and I said absolutely. So they send me out there. Now here's now here's again. It all comes back around. Remember, I told you my father taught me about independence. They sent me out to Japan by myself. You know what I'm saying? Nobody no corner, with no, no, corner. no corner, no nothing. They, yeah, they sent me. Yeah, they sent me to Japan by myself. I had to rise to the occasion. You know, I mean, it was it was a scary experience to fight because I had looked up. To, like when you were a uh, under when you were a light fighter back then, Shudo was the organization. It wasn't a UFC because they didn't have weight classes. They, they, they 
Yeah, they didn't have weight classes back then. So it wasn't a UFC. There was no opportunity for light guys. So Shudo was the pinnacle. So I got that call, and I was like, heck yeah. So I had been watching Shudo. I loved Sato, that fight between Sato and Uno. That's still one of my favorite fights of all time. So I got the call, and they was like, you don't fight Uno. I was like, oh, my God. Are you kidding me? Like He just beat Sato. And I went out there. I gave him my all. But I got to tell you, I got to tell you, um, a part of me, a part of like what I was saying about being a, being a quitter, it came out in that fight. It came out in that fight because I was doing so well. I was kicking his butt. I kicked his butt for the first two rounds. And then that third round, I just gave up. I was just so happy to be able to compete at that level that I just gave up. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting. Thank you for sharing that because that's probably yeah. courageous to say. Having said that, uh, like I remember talking to Dennis Kang when he was talking about his fight with Michael Bispin, and uh, he was like, dude, I went out for that second round and my adrenaline dump took me and I had no energy. And I looked at him and you're like, yeah, you're telling the truth. You could tell, right? And then you talked to Jeremy Horn about his fight with Forrest Griffin and how it was amazing. And then how Bob Lou is all beat up and he's got to fight him. And he's like, oh, I can't do it. And then he just ends up losing over time. But for you to say that this thing comes up again in your life, this thing that you got to battle. And because, I, dude, there's nothing in my research of you that calls you a quitter whatsoever. In fact, you probably do more stuff than you can handle. But tell me about that moment so you're happy about it you want to move on what well, how do you deal with that mentality are you upset or are you just like you know what that's okay what no nah, like it i mean it really upset me because i was like damn like i could be you know what i'm saying like it, i was like beat your hero yeah yeah i could have yeah. beat my hero and i could be the number one fighter in the world yeah you know what i'm saying like that but i didn't feel like it was ready for me at the time, you know, like I'm sitting there thinking like, here I am some, you know, some young kid who essentially taught himself how to fight watching videos. I had no instructor. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I had no jujitsu back, no like formal jujitsu background. I had no boxing coach. I had no wrestling coach. Yeah. I was just going to gyms, beating people up. And when somebody would get me with something, I'd ask them how they did it. You know what I'm saying? And then I would know how to do it. I had I gotta- no coach. Yeah. Let me ask this question because this seems to be a very interesting theme. And it seems like in that fight with Kyle, you, they're, they're always the Japanese say that the student is ready to slay the master. And it seems to me in that moment, you weren't ready to slay the master. No, I wasn't. I wasn't ready. But, but I'd, I'd say you slay masters all over the time now. Was there, yeah. when did that start to change for you? Um, that's tough to say. I, I think it took me it took me a little while to realize what I was capable of, you know. Um, you know, and one thing about the whole fight game is it's so it's such a journey, a personal journey of roller of a roller coaster ride for everybody. And things change, you evolve as a human being, you evolve as a person, and sometimes timing isn't right and sometimes like you could be good and like mentally you're not but then sometimes you're mentally there but physically you're injured so it's such a journey so i think there were times where i was fully ready to be the best in the world like when i fought jens pulver when i fought him like this was this was two years after i had that um japan moment which helped me yeah because when i fought jens i was ready yeah yeah I was ready to be the best in the world. And I, I had told everybody before that fight, I'm the best in the world. This he's coming to my, he coming to me and I beat him. And, um, and I think that was kind of when I really hit my stride, you know, when I hit my stride, which is terrible to say that, like, you know, I was, <laughs> I had fought as a, as a professional fighter up until 2013, but my prime was in 2001. You know what I'm saying? It's from what I think when I fought Jens was essentially like my prime mentally as a fighter. Physically, it might have been later, but mentally 2001 when I fought Jens, if I was if I was if I was able to maintain that up from 2010 to 2013, I'd have probably been world champ. Well, and there's so many changes that happen in the evolution and momentum of it, man. I I think that you are mentally more powerful now than you ever have been based on 
stand up comedy based oh, on all the action today. stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah like, today, yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. and then when I'm I talking about as a as a fighter, as a fighter, yeah. I was yeah. my strongest mentally back in two thousand one. Well, how did you lose that strength mentally in the next couple fights? Um, was it just injury, or it, you know, it's funny. It's something that Mikey Burnett told me. You know, we were in a house on the Ultimate Fighter season four, and we're talking one day, and he goes, "Man, you was a killer up until you fought BJ. BJ killed your confidence." And I said, "Man, you know what? You're right. You're right. Because up until BJ, you know, I thought I was, I thought I was unbeatable. And then when BJ knocked me out, it was like." I got really cautious, and then I realized that I was like human. They're like, I can get knocked out. I this can happen to me, you know. But, and 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 that's what really hurt me about the BJ fight was that it was in New Jersey, and I had all my childhood friends from Delaware come Ugh. come to the fight, you know. That and has an, that has an effect, doesn't it? Yeah, it had an effect on me. So it was like like all this stuff, you know, me trying to do something, everybody supporting me. And then I felt like I let them down. So like that really was like that really kind of killed me for a couple of years, man. It really hurt me for a couple of years, my confidence. And it took me a while to like really get it back. Yeah, I mean, and BJ is still fighting, but I think he's way past his prime. And oh, God. Uh, we yeah. love him. We love him. But it, it it's more scary now because. You know, we, you've got such fond memories of these guys. I mean, Chuck and Tito are going to fight here in a little bit. And you're just like, guys, like, I know we all got to make money, but. Uh, yeah, there's easier uh, ways. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. See, uh, that's that's the difference between me and them, though. Yeah. You know, um, I think at some level, they're more, you know, I always break. When I'm training athletes, I always break it down. You're either a fighter, an athlete, or a great competitor. I'm going to have to add one more to that. And it's what I think I was as an artist, because when I look back at myself, I never thought of myself as really being a fighter because I only trained to fight. So I didn't get beat up in the street. But what I consider myself, what I was doing inside that cage was art. That was me. I was an artist, which is why I have no problem now of never fighting again and using my art at other things. Like right now I'm doing this interview from a imp improvisational comedy studio. I'm sitting in, an, in in the lobby of an improv comedy studio doing this because I'm an artist. So I'm going to express my art one way or the other, whether, whether it was fighting before or through comedy and acting right now. Yeah, uh, I love that um, because it, it, it truly, I believe fighting is an art. And when yeah. you understand it at its purest form, it's a dance. And uh, and then it's also, I mean, boxing is a sweet science. It's in a beautiful, jujitsu is magic when it first happened everybody was like well how did that even happen right yeah it's um, magic and and so i love that and I, I love the fact that you didn't have done something that so many fighters have not been able to do and that's been able to transfer their ability and art within the fight into something more and something a little bit that has more longevity and something that you're a natural at when it comes to comedy and acting because that is not an easy gig and you just keep doing any espn tv uh radio show all the stuff you're doing man it, it really it i really love doing this interview because i think you show as an inspiration as hey man when you're fighting life's over your new life really just begins and you're showing that yeah i mean it, I, I feel bad for a lot of guys who who struggle with that you know, I try to coach as many, you know, retired fighters as I can to, to kind of get through that. I had a, I had a conversation with Akira Kasani um, a few a few months ago, and he was talking about how how he was depressed for a long time until he found a camera and said, now I can I can be I'm going to be a photographer. So I'm going to express myself through photography. You know, when Eve Edwards first retired, he struggled. It, it, it wasn't until this year where I think he realized that, like, you can't, I'm not going back to fighting. Yeah. And cause he always had entertained the idea that man, he, maybe he needs to come out of retirement and fight one more time. And for me, when I, the day I retired, I never once again wanted to even train the way I used to train as a fighter. So yeah. never again. Yeah. Never again. Like well, I took all my energy. I took all my energy and I rehearse improv three times a week. I have I'm working on a play right now, you mm -hmm. know, so I'm, I'm doing stuff. Yeah, we're going to link uh, a bunch of all the stuff you're doing, because when I was I usually do about an hour and a half 
uh, research and I couldn't get through all your stuff. I was like, oh no, Ben's <laughs> gonna catch me out here. He's gonna know I'm a, I'm a rookie. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, Cause there's so much and it's exciting uh, to see that. But I wanna, and I, I wanna move into uh, meeting Monica and, and your kid. But before we do that, I just gotta ask this question. Um, a lot of people, I don't know this, and I think you might've mentioned it in uh, looking for a fight, but to you and Matt Sarah and Dana White are in that show and you have a win over Matt Sarah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a win. So like that was um that fight was in was in Atlantic City. That was the first time a lot of things happened uh in the UFC. We me and Matt don't ever get cr- a lot of credit for this. So we had a we had a fight. You know, we and me and Matt had some beef too. Like, you know, this is when like MySpace was pretty popular and um we would be on the underground forum and and so when that fight was announced, me and Matt, like, well, it wasn't really Matt. It was like his people, like people in New York, man, they ride or they ride with their homeboy. And I might have said something on the Internet. So, like, I was arguing with all his people. So, like, it was like a personal fight between me and him. Like, it was, like, very personal like because we kind of hated each other. And um, so we fought in Atlantic City. And I thought I did. I executed my game plan perfectly. But they raised his hand and announced him the winner. And, you know, he thought he won the fight. However, one of the judges had the scorecard upside down as he was putting the numbers in, and they counted it wrong. So we go backstage. Dana White comes backstage and go, hey, man, you won that fight. And I'm upset. I'm like, man, I don't, I don't know what to do. And he's like, "You no, you won that fight. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, man, the judge had it wrong. You won the fight. So, but they never went back out and they corrected they it. You never got your hand raised. In I that. never got my hand raised. And now you got to do like seven seasons with this guy where you got where everybody <laughs> thinks that you beat you. Yeah. So, but I got him back though. So on that episode of, of Stur- and we were in Sturgis, I got a tattoo right here on my arm that says, Hey Matt, I won. So <laughs> yeah, a lot of people. Yeah. I got, That's it says, amazing. Hey Matt, I won. So, so, but the other, the other thing that happened in that fight that the people won't rem- remember is that the lights in the whole arena went out for a couple of seconds. So like we're in the cage and there's no lights on in the arena that all the electricity went out in the arena and me, while me and Matt were, while we were fighting. So were you grappling or were you just squaring off? Where, where was this? We were, we, yeah, we were standing up. Like if I could go back in time, when if, if I knew them lights were going to go out, I would have stuck them. <laughs> but <laughs> so it'd be like that blood sport, blood yeah. sport part where you're just yeah. ah, screaming yeah. around and throwing punches and kicks in the dark thinking yeah. that's doing yeah. something to the light to get up. <laughs> that's, the to come out. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, yeah. That, thank you for that. That's hilarious. And I, I yeah. think you guys have such great chemistry. And it's good to see that beef turn into a friendship. Like, Yeah, because it's crazy because then when then when we went on uh, Ultimate Fighter, you know, we went to the uh, like kind of the audition for that. And then we, we saw each other in the van and then we walked around the mall together. We was like, you know what, man, this is kind of stupid, right? Like, what are we even doing? Like, why are we talking trash about each other? And next thing I know, we're on the same team on the show and then we're roommates and and we just became like really, really, really good friends. And you know, he's one of my greatest friends in the sport. Yeah, he's he's great. And uh, yeah. we're hoping to get him on the show soon. So we may need your help to do that. Um, yeah. Having said that, let's talk about meeting Monica and your son. Uh, am I saying his name right, Ethan? Yeah, Ethan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When when did you meet her? What was uh, you know love at first sight, or did she just track you down? And so yeah. again, man, everything comes back around everything so remember i told the story about you know hitting the kid yeah that's monica (laughs) i had no idea yeah well so look at that uh all comes back around well we don't want to we don't want to tell everybody that's how you win the woman if you're choosing (laughs) man (laughs) yeah (laughs) having said that uh amazing but so so her dad's breaking you up he's already must not like you but he must love the fact that you're in love with her um do you guys connect again like right after that and no i mean it it took a little while so you know we we actually met like we were met in like ninth grade for the first time you know like we're just in class and school but we didn't start like dating officially till like my 11th grade year so like that's when it happened my 11th and 12th grade years when we were dating kind of off and on and then she broke up with me and then um so then the incident happened and then like, I mean, she was obviously like terrified of me for like, 
for like six months, like didn't want to talk to me for like six months. But eventually she came back around and, you know, I had started my fighting career and was doing all going through that whole thing. And she moved to Orlando to go to University of Central Florida, which is, you know, where I ended up. I, I mean, I didn't go to University of Central Florida, but I was in Orlando training and fighting and beating people up and she was going to school there. So then that's kind of like where we kind of reconnected again. So, um, and here's the thing about being a fighter and any fighter can attest to this. Any serious fighter can attest to this is that when you're on a come up, you don't have much, you don't have much. And, you know, there were times where like, I was like homeless and I lived with her and slept on her couch, you know, and things like that. So, I mean, she was really kind of there for me when I needed me or what I needed somebody. So like, you know, being in Orlando as an up and coming fighter at a time where, you know, you're making a couple hundred bucks a fight, but you're training full time and all day long, you know? So like I'd live with her and stay at her house and eat all her food and sneak. So yeah. So like, yeah, that's, that's kind of how that happened. That's amazing. And then, um, uh, how old's Ethan and when did, when did he come around? Um, so we, so me and her, we got married, um, in 2003, <laughs> I should know this. <laughs> yeah. You know the date. You don't need to know yeah. the year, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. We got married. We got married in 2003. And then, um, then we moved, we moved to, uh, we we first moved to coconut Creek or Boca Raton. So I could train at American top team. I moved there before. And then she moved down with me when after we got married, and then, and then I moved back to Port St. Lucie in two thousand and five, uh, and and that's when Ethan was born. Sweet, yeah, and, um, and that's when he was born. I know that uh, Josh on your ESPN show, sorry, um, was joking about uh, on one of the other interviews that I saw about the moment you lost your son's trust. <laughs> and uh, I love that question because it's so, what? What do you mean you lost your son's trust? And I, and I read the story, but uh, I, I just, it's so hard sometimes to, to, to do stuff with kids <laughs> and not get hurt, right? Tell, tell me what, he, what, what that moment was again. So I don't know if in Canada you guys have uh, a BJ's a BJ's wholesale club. So BJ's is like it's like a big it's a wholesale store where you could buy a lot of you know, food groceries and a lot of different things at in bulk. But they also have a, a bakery section, and then you know in every bakery section there's the there's the old lady who gives cookies to kids, the free cookies to kids. So my son, he's incredibly shy, shyer, probably more shy than I was at his age. He was about, I think like five, in between five and seven years old. And we're walking around the store and we get to the bakery section and he's like, dad, can I have a cookie? And I'm like, well, you got to ask the young, you got to ask the lady. And he's, like I said, incredibly shy, like afraid of his own shadow shy. And he goes, he must've really wanted his cookie because he was like, okay, I'll do it. I said, yeah, just ask Lee if you can have a cookie. And he goes to the lady, and he's so cute. He's like, can I have a cookie? And the lady goes, we well, have to ask, you know, ask your father. And he looks up at me, and I said, boy, is you crazy? You ain't have no damn cookie. <laughs> oh, and you're some yeah. therapy. <laughs> yeah. So the moment, the moment he was actually able to step out of his shell, I ruined it for him. He ain't, he ain't trust me since. He roasts me on the internet now. He talks bad about me to his friends. It's terrible. Oh man, I'm de you know it's uh it's a terrible to have such a great sense of humor and to not have it. But that's growing up, man. Yeah, you need like that. I love that. That's uh, every that's everybody's got to get roasted. <laughs> that's absolutely true. Uh, okay, cool. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's move to Amanda and Tyrone. Okay, you got, wonderful. You, yeah, man, you got champs. You need yeah. the American top team right now. And uh, everybody that's a fighter wants to understand what the secrets are. How do you get these guys to that level? And I mean, there's three things that I hear when I talk to David Lee and, and Rory McDonald, and you talk to those guys. And across the board, coaches always say the same thing, but I, I wonder if there's something different. They always say hard work, a little bit of luck, and um, and the ability to adapt. 
uh, in situations that are uncommon. Like, it, like I'm not in the right situation. I don't know what to do. You got to find a way. So those are three things that we hear about. But when you get to the level where you got you got the two awesome champions right now, is there something <laughs> that tweaks that a little bit more? Is there something more that takes someone from being good to great? Um. This is a tough question. And I don't want to and I don't want to sound salty about this or make anybody look bad. But it's the God honest truth. Something about champions. And it's going to it's going to come across bad and hopefully I can clarify it to where it's not, not so bad. But the, the one thing I found with um a champion or anybody who I feel like has the potential to be a champion you have to be incredibly selfish. And I think that is a common denominator. You have to be extremely selfish. You have to, uh, you know, almost not care about other people's time because you're so concerned about getting your own reps in. You have to, you have to be, be willing to, you know, just be on your own time because you're trying to do more than everybody else. And that's the one thing about, you know, Tyron and Amanda is they're very selfish when it comes to their training. I mean, and I, 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 that kind of sounds bad, but it's the reason why they're so they're so dedicated to their progress that they don't care about other people's progress because they're so dedicated to their progress. Right. Uh, it's interesting that you say that and, and selfish is one word to describe it, but I think goal focused and oriented and, and to let no other things step in and distraction, no distractions, maybe a way to say that as well. Um, and I love the way you say that. However, then it's got to change when like not, not it's got to change, but at a certain point you can start to be a champion, be selfish with your time. And then all of a sudden you're a champion and you got requirements you got people saying, "Hey, come hang out at this supplement place. We'll give you twenty grand." You now, now you're like, "How do I say no to these opportunities that I've never had before?" And how do you make sure you can maintain focus on a champion now that has been selfish with his time, but now has responsibilities, obligations, and and just, "Hey, the, I make twenty grand if I show up here. It's ridiculous." You know, is that how do you do well, that? Well, Tyron is a special individual. When it comes to Tyron, anyway, Amanda's a little different. Tyron, he's the hardest working guy I've ever met. That guy goes to bed at five and wakes up at seven. <laughs> and he's he's so extroverted. He he just feeds off of the energy of people around him that keeps him going. So like this, like you think I do a lot, like Tyron does a lot. Like he's got kids and he's at all their games and then he's like doing working on his album and he's like calling these sponsors like he manages himself when the fight game he does all his deals himself i mean he does have some people helping him in different areas but like he does everything himself he's so ocd and he's so and he likes to kind of micromanage himself and and things and things in that nature but he's just everywhere and it's it's uh, like it's inspiring for me because I, I try to do things, but I can't keep up with them. But Amanda's different. Amanda's the, the total opposite. Like she likes to just she likes to fish and sit at home and and light you know put a bonfire on. You know, Tyron likes to be out in the streets working and hustling. So for Amanda to do things like that can be kind of distraction, a distraction for her to do these uh, interviews. And stuff. But for Tyron, Tyron's like. Bring them, bring them on, bring them on, bring the next one. Let's do the next one. Let's do the next one. So based on, as long as you're strong enough to make sure your time is your own and you're selfish, based on whether you're dealing with somebody who's more extroverted versus introverted, you're not going to take energy away from an extrovert by giving them extrovert activities. And you're right. not going to take energy away from an introvert if they're going to go fishing and do that. Those things are okay to the personalities. You switch it, we messed up, right? Yeah, you messed up. You, you know, <laughs> I tried to get Tyron to um to take a break from th some things. Sometimes I try. I say, "Hey, man, listen. Let's t let's take the phone away. You know, let's just go out and do nothing for it." He can't do it. He cannot do. He cannot switch it. He has to be out working and hustling. He has to. That's it. That's him. 
Amanda, like she has to get like she'll do like media stuff. She has to get up for it, but she's an introvert. She just wants to, you know, get her RV, drive around with Nina and hang out and play and, you know, and just stay low. Like be, you know, hang out in the house with a beer. That's yeah. her. Huh. That's awesome. Hey, Dinwood, I think we're just about at time, man. I've had a great time uh, with you here. And I, I really if you when you when you get out to Vancouver, make sure you reach out to me and, and we'll go do dinner and I'll show you some of the sites around here because it's Hollywood North, man. And if you're doing improv there, we got a whole bunch of other projects here for you here. But yeah, man, I, we, yeah, yeah, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to, to getting out to Vancouver. Everybody knows that Vancouver is is the spot for movies. So I'm yeah. definitely want to be able to make it out there at least once the yeah. one gig, you know, yeah, absolutely. But before we go, uh, I want to finish when I think you kind of started answering this question. We always like to go back and sort of give respect to the people that brought us into the world and uh, and ask that question is, uh, you know, what's one of the most valuable or useful things that you learned uh, from your family growing up? You know, family, family is important. You know, the one thing about family is that, um, you know, you, you only get one of them. You know what I'm saying? Like you get one mother, you get one father, you know, they're not going to be perfect. And I think, you know, when you're growing up as a kid, you know, you look up to me, you think they're going to be perfect and they're not. And you got to understand it regardless. You got to love them anyway, because you only get one and this, and they're not going to be here one day. And, and I, and I'll tell you this, one of the saddest moments that I've ever had in my life was when uh, my mother-in-law passed away and my son, and she was like, she was so dear to my son. Like, cause when I, when I'd be off on trips or my wife was working, she, she pr practically raised him. And I watched her in the hospital with my son, you know, going fighting cancer right before she died. And my son was just holding her hand. And it was one of the saddest moments I've ever experienced. And that vision still hits me sometimes where, and it just realized that like one day they're not going to be around and you got to learn to appreciate people, especially your family while they're here. So, you know, if there's anything I learned from family, is it whether they perfect, whether you put them on a pedestal or not, not you always got to appreciate them while they're here because they're not always going to be here. And while they're here, you got to show them some love. Man, I, I, that's a wonderful place to end the interview. And I agree, my father passed away three years ago. And, and when you start realizing that the importance that they have, good or bad, in your life, uh, and you realize that one day they're not going to be there, it's hard to fill that gap. But uh, once you have the maturity, you realize that while they're alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, always, then we, show, always show them love. You know, whether, whether, you got, whether you got beef with them or you don't agree on something, it doesn't matter because when they're gone, that's it. You know, yeah. you don't have a chance to to have a good moment with them. And, and this life is all about sharing good moments. And who better to share moments with than family? <laughs> you said it better than I could have, my friend. Thank yeah. you so much, Dan. I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, we're going to put a bunch of links for all your stuff uh, at the end of this so people can connect in and see the projects that you're working on right now. But thank you so much for taking the time today on this Sunday. I know you're busy at the Improv Club, but uh, thanks so much. And let's talk again soon. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, guys. Thanks again for your support of fighters, coaches, and fathers for doing some amazing things, and we couldn't do it without you. Subscribe by clicking the circle on the left, and click on the box on the right for the full interview with my friend, Jesse Bongfeld.